okay, so section 12.2, hopefully by the time I post this online, it will say 12.2 at the top, but just in case it doesn't, I've made the informal change. We're gonna talk about, so last time we talked about just terminology related to statistics um, and the difference between um, uh, inferential statistics and descriptive statistics. So we are gonna focus mainly on descriptive statistics and looking at how data is organized and how, uh, how some, some things we can do with it. That's what's gonna happen in our next couple sections. This is not a class we're gonna talk about where the data comes from. So first example up at the top, because this section is titled frequency distributions and statistical graphs. So frequency distribution is a way to organize data that has been given. Um, if you take statistics, you'll talk in a, a lot more depth about this. So we are just doing a really fast flyby. So the following set of data represents the family income in thousands of dollars of 15 randomly selected families. And there's the data right there in no particular order. And so what we're going to do is we're going to construct a frequency distribution with a first class of 31.5 to 37.6. Okay. So when you actually take a statistics class, you will learn how to make your classes, uh, how, uh, where that comes from. In this class, you will be given that information. Okay, but just know that that comes from somewhere. That's part of the design of the structure. But for now, here's what I would like you to know. In this class, okay, the 31.5, the 31.5 is called the lower class limit. Some books will call it the class boundary. Uh, our book calls it the class limit. So that's the lower class limit. And then the 37.6 is the upper class limit. And so some characteristics of our frequency distribution is what we're going to do is we are going to list classes so that we have enough classes to accommodate our data. We're not going to have more, uh, more classes than, than, than we need. And a couple things about the class limits is the class, uh, excuse me, the classes, a couple things about the classes is the classes do not overlap. And all the classes, so they don't overlap and they should all be equal size. So we have to have a methodology to construct our classes. And that's going to be the first thing that, that we talk about. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to make a couple columns here. I'm going to make a column for income, which is what our data represents. And then I'm going to make a column for frequency, meaning how many times does something fall in that class. We are given our first class is 31.5 to uh, 37.6. So then the question is, okay, how do I get the rest of my classes? Okay, and that's a great question. So I've already told you that our classes cannot overlap. They're all gonna have the same size. So the first thing is they don't overlap. Well, if 31.5 is this lower class limit and 37.6 is the upper, what would you guess? Okay, just make a guess. If you're right, great. If you're wrong, it's no big deal. We're here to learn. What would you guess is the next lower class limit if things are not going to overlap? 37.7, that is a great guess because we noticed that all of my data here is to the tenths, okay? So the next, uh, the next tenths place after 37.6 is going to be 37.7, okay? Great job, love that guess, that was great. Now, now that we have that bit of information, we can calculate something that's gonna be a very good uh, piece of data for us. We are gonna calculate using these, lower, these two lower limits, we're gonna calculate what's called the class width. Meaning how far apart is my class width? 
Now I'm going to define the class width because this is something I want us all to be crystal clear on. This is probably the only thing that students in my classes ever stumble across when, when we're, I ask you to make a frequency distribution on the test. The class width is the difference between two consecutive lower limits or two consecutive upper limits. Yes. I'm going to give you a moment to write. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you a moment to write that down and then I'm going to tell you what the class width is not. And this is where sometimes students stumble when they are in this section. What the class width is not, it is not the difference between the upper and the lower limit, okay? You do not take that difference to get the class width, okay? So we would not, okay, this would be wrong. We would not take the difference between 37.6 and 31.5 to get the class width. Okay, I understand that seems like a reasonable thing to do, but that's not right. We are gonna use our two consecutive lower limits to get the class width. So for this case, it is 37.7 minus 31.5. And whatever that is, I'm just gonna pull out my calculator here, 37.7 minus 31.5. You can be doing the same thing. That's 6.2. So now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to use this value, this class width, and I'm going to find all of my lower limits. And you might say, hey, Perkster, where do you stop? You don't stop until you accommodate your largest piece of data. And if I'm looking at this data, it looks like the largest piece of data is 65.2. If you see something bigger, let me know, but I think I've got that. So I'm going to do lower class limits until I have a class that will accommodate 65.2. So I've just going to keep adding this 6.2. So when I take 37.7 and I add 6.2 to it, I get the next lower limit is 43.9. Okay, I'm going to keep going. 43.9 is not bigger than 65.2. So I'm going to add another 6.2 to that and I get 50.1. Again, 50.1 is not bigger than my largest piece of data. So I'm going to do it again. Uh, whoops, hit the wrong button on my calculator. So pausing, pausing, pausing. So now plus 6.2, I get 56.3. Then I'm going to add 6.2 one more time. And when I add 6.2 one more time, I get 62.5. And if I was to add 6.2 again, you can see that we're going to get 68.7. And 68.7 is bigger than my biggest piece of data. So I do not need another lower class limit. Okay, I now have enough classes that's going to accommodate all of my values. And then I'm just going to go do the same thing for the upper limit. All the upper limits are going to be 6.2 apart. So I start with that 37.6 and I'm gonna add 6.2 and I get 43.8. And you should be able to check. 43.8 is this upper limit. What's the next lower limit? 43.9, good, they don't overlap. They are consecutive, so that is great news. I'm gonna add 6.2 again and I get 50.0. All right, so now you're complicating things though. So I wouldn't do that because then the tendency, and this is where students make mistakes, is they, they'll they just add, you cannot just add 6.2 to the lower limit to get the upper. And so then if you're thinking, oh, I can just take a little bit away, now, now you're adding, I think, more to the process. So then the next one I add 6.2 is 56.2. And when I do it again, I'm going to get 62.4. And again, noticing my next lower limit is 62.5. So everything is good. And then one more time, I get 68.6. There's my classes.
Getting the classes is the hardest part to the process. Once you've done that, it's now just a matter of putting the data in the appropriate class. Now, this data is not in order, so this is going to take us just a moment to do. So what I'm just going to do is in the middle here in this blank space, I'm just going to do what's called a tally. Okay, this is not technically part of the frequency distribution, but it helps me get the right result. So 46.5, 46.5 is going to be in the third class. So I'm going to make a little mark there, the third class. And I'm going to cross that out so I don't double count it. 65.2, 65.2 is in the last class. So I'll put a little mark there. Does everyone understand why I'm making a mark in a particular place? I'm just putting the appropriate piece of data uh, in, in its class. 35.5 is in the first class. 31.8 is also in the first class. 52.4 is in this class right here. 40.3 is in the second class. 45.8 is in the third class. 44.6 is also in the third class. 39.8 is in the second. 44.7 is in the third once again. 53.7 is in the fourth. 56.3 is right there in the fifth. 40.9, second. 48.8. Now, when you do a tally to make it easier to count, uh, I mean, you could just keep making marks, but the kind of the appropriate process when you make a tally is every fifth one you mark through so that you have groups of five when you count at the end and you don't go blind counting all the straight lines. And then 50.7 is in the fourth class. So that's just my tool. The frequency column, I'm just going to add up the marks. How many, how many pieces of data occurred in the first class? Two. How many pieces of data occurred in the second? Three. How many pieces of data occurred in the fourth, or excuse me, the third? Five, and then three, and then one, and then one. If there was a class that did not have any, you would put zero. You don't just leave that class out. Uh, you have to account for every one of your classes. And that right there, my friends, is called a frequency distribution. Okay, it tells you the frequency that values occur in each of these classes. Like I said, in this class, you will be given the first class, but uh, when you take statistics, if that is your math destiny, you will, uh, you will have a process. The, the, the boundaries here depend on how much data you have, how, much, how many values you want in each class. So that's just, <coughs> that, that uh, is something that can change depending on the problem. All right, any questions before I have you do one? All right, well then have fun. Example two is your example. You're gonna do the same thing that I just did, but with this new set of data. So the data represents uh, the approximate 2018 population in millions of the 20 most populous cities in the world. And so I want you to create a frequency distribution and the first class should be 12.0 to 15.9.
just want to give everybody a nudge. Okay, so I'm not getting started. But here's my first class, 12.0 to 15.9. So in order to find the class width, I need the next lower boundary. So what is the next value after 15.9? 16.0, that is indeed true. And so now you have the information you need to find the class width, and then you can find all of your classes that will accommodate all of your data up to 38.0. Up to So what is the class width of this set of data? How do I calculate that? Right, it's the 16.0 minus the 12.0. Okay, I'm just gonna repeat the definition. Your class width is the difference between either two consecutive lower limits or two consecutive upper. Well, I have two consecutive lowers, so I will subtract those and that becomes 4.0. So I'm gonna use that now. I'm just gonna add 4.0 to all these. So 4.0 here gives me 20.0, plus four more is 24.0, four more is 28.0. I need to accommodate the value 38. So I'm gonna keep going, 32.0. 36.0, and then the next one, if I add four more to this, becomes 40, and 40 is bigger than my lowest, p or excuse me, my largest piece of data, so I do not need to go any further. Now I'll do the same thing to the upper limits. I'm going to add 4.0 to each of these, so when I add 4.0, I get 19.9. When I add 4.0, I get 23.9. When I add 4.0, 27. 0.9 and then 31.9 and then 35.9 and last but not least 39.9. Let me pause because that's kind of the uh, that's kind of the hardest thing to do with the frequency distribution. Anybody got a question about where any of my lower or any of my upper limits came from? It's a great question if you've got one. Okay, now we're just going to count the frequency. Now, this data is in number order. You're welcome to do a tally if you want. But now my first, my first uh, class goes up to 15.9. So that is going to, I'm just going to cross them out as I count them. I'm going to go through all the values that fit from 12.0 to 15.9. That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And then 16.6 .6 is going to be in the next class. So there are eight values in the first class. Did I count that right? We good? All right, the next one goes from 16.0 to 19.9. So that is one, two, three, four, and 20.2 is gonna be in the next class. So that is four values in the second class. The next class goes from 20.0 to 23.9. So to up to 23.9, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six. So there's six in that class. The next one is 24.0 to 27.9. That is just this next piece of data, one. The next class is 28.0 to 31.9. There are no values that fit in that class. The next one's 32.0 to 35.9. Again, there's no values in that class. And finally, 36.0 to 39.9, there is that final one, what we would 
call an outlier because it seems to be, if we look at this distribution, it seems to be significantly different than the others. And there is my frequency distribution. Questions, comments, concerns before we move on to the next one. I don't want to rush you through. I want to answer any questions that you have. All right, then we'll top the next page. Please do the same thing. This time we've got some whole number data. That's fine. Doesn't really change much of anything that you do. Why you got earrings and everything? <laughs> All right, just to give everyone a nudge, make sure we're doing the right thing. Uh, we're to asked to do a frequency distribution. The first class is 42 to 47. All of my data is whole numbers. There's not a decimal to be seen. So what is going to be the next lower limit of this, uh, of my classes? 48, there you go. It's the next whole number up, 48. So use that if you haven't already, uh, use that to figure out what your class width is. So the most time consuming part of this problem, I'm guessing is uh, putting the data in the appropriate place. So I'm, I'm assuming that I've given a fairly adequate amount of time to make the classes. So I'm gonna get started on this. So what we've got here is a initial class of 42 to 47 that was given to us. So in order to figure out the class width, I need the next lower limit. So the number that comes after 47 is 48. And so remember, again, I'm just gonna repeat this. The class width is the difference between two consecutive lowers or two consecutive uppers. So I have two consecutive lower limits, 48 minus 42 is six. My largest piece of data, the oldest person in this, I think is that 69. Do we see any uh, in the seventies here? 
I don't, but if you see it, let me know. So we need a class that will accommodate to the value 69. So I'm just gonna add six to get my lower limits. So 48 plus six is 54. 54 plus six is 60. 60 plus six is 66. And when I add six more, I would get 72. And 72 is bigger than my, my biggest piece of data, so I do not need another class. That will be adequate to account for everything. To get my upper limits, again, I do the same thing. I'm just gonna take that class width of six, and I'm gonna add it to my upper limits. So 47 plus six, uh, 47 plus six is 53, which is good because 53, the next lower limb is 54. So I've done all my arithmetic right. Plus six more, I get 59. Plus six more, I get 65. And plus six more, I get 71. Again, the characteristics of my classes is they should all be equal size, which they are, and they should not overlap. Okay, or bump up against each other. They are, uh, and that is true as well. So now I've got to go through the data. Sorry about this. This is a little bit of a chore. I'm just going to go down the columns and try to do this as quick as I can. So uh, if you get something different than me, let me know. 57 is here, and then 61, and then another pair of 57s and a 58. That third class was pretty popular. I'm just going to cross out that column. Going again, 57 again. So every fifth one I like to cross out so I don't go blind. And then 61, and then 54, and then 68, and then 51 is in this class. Done with that column. Does everyone see why I'm putting a mark in the particular class? I know I'm kind of going fast, uh, but I'm just putting each value in its place. We're doing a tally since the data is not in number order uh, so, that, so that we can then figure out what our frequencies are. So going down the next column, 49 is in the second class and then 64 is down here, 50 is in the second class, 48 is in the second class and 65 is in that class right there. I'm on the fourth column right now. So 52 is in the second class. That second class is catching up. And then 56 is in the third, 46, and then 54, and then 49. That's the fourth column. The fifth column, we've got 50 and 47 is in the first. 55 is in the third, another 55 and a 54. That middle one is the most popular class so far. Going down the next one, we've got 42, and then 51, and then 56, and then 55, and finally another 51. We're almost done, and you're thinking, thank you, just want to be done. All right, 54, and then 51, whoop, and then 60, whoop, and then 62 is in this class, and then 43, whoop, 55 is in this class, 56 is also in this class, 61 is in this one, 52 is here, and then 69 is right here, and then last but not least, we're in the final four, woohoo, I've got 64, and then 46, and then 54, and then 47, there we go. So there's my tally. I did that real quick, hopefully not too quick, or at least hopefully you see where everything went. This is what matters though. The tally is not necessarily what matters. There's other ways to do this calculation if you want, but the frequency, the first class 42 to 47 occurs six times. The second class 48 to 53 occurs 11 times. 54 to 59 has 17 pieces of data. 60 to 65 has uh, eight pieces of data. And then last but not least, that final category has two pieces of data. And there we go. There's my frequency distribution. I got one more example. I'm gonna step through this one with you because there is a special situation uh, when, we're, when we're doing this, uh, what our, our classes are gonna look a little different. So I'm gonna slide up, but before I do, any questions, comments, or concerns? Anything that I know that we just whipped through that example, y'all, uh, I know you walked, just walked in. Anything that I need to go back over? Not sure where anything came from. Okay, yeah, it's, yeah. this is not the, a super difficult process uh, if, if you get it from the beginning. Anybody else? Anybody got anything? 
All right, the last one is uh, an example. I just wanted to make sure to cover this for you. This is an example of, I've got all whole number data and I'm asked to do something with a class width of one. Okay, so uh, all of my data is whole numbers, class width of one. So when you are asked to do this with a class width of one and you've got whole number data, there's no decimals, then instead of doing a range of values for the data, you're just gonna use the individual data points as your class. So in this one, we've got the number of children per family. For 64 different families, we're gonna construct a frequency distribution with a class width of one. So we've got the, uh, the number of children is going to be my first column. And then the frequency is always the second column. And what I mean by this is when you got a class with one, you got a whole number data, instead of doing a range of values, my classes are just gonna be the numbers zero, one, two, down through nine. So I don't need to do like zero to 0 0.9 or anything like that because there's no decimals. Uh, so that would just be overkill. So again, this data is in order, that's good. So I'm just gonna count up the number of, of people who had this many children in each class. So we start off with the zeros and there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of those. Then the ones, there's two, four, six, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 of those. The twos, two, four, five, six, seven, nine, 11, 13, 15, 17, 18. The threes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. The fours, one, two, three, four, five, six. And we're gonna notice a drop off here, one, two, three, four. In the five category, there's two in the six category, there's one in the seven category, there's two in the eight, and then nine got one. There we go. A lot of kids. I had a friend who had 12, so there you go. But they're not, they're not in this survey, clearly. And there's my frequency distribution. All right, so that's kind of the bulk of this first section. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our frequency distributions and we're going to, uh, we're gonna look at some different ways that we can organize the data in pictures because we like pictures. So the next problem on the next page, I'm gonna do this example. Uh, well, we're actually gonna work examples together uh, because there's two types of pictures that we are going to talk about that come from a frequency distribution. The first one we're gonna do is what's called a histogram. Okay, histogram is, is just a fancy word for a bar graph that we're going to do. And so on my histogram, what I'm gonna do, you don't have to do this, but what I'm gonna do just to uh, hopefully make everything sort of clear is I'm gonna, I'm gonna rip off my front page so that I can have quick, easy access to the, to the data we're going to use. Uh, so here is, here is my, here's my frequency distribution that we made a little earlier. And what I'm gonna do is we're gonna construct a histogram from this. So I've got all of my classes, okay, that we came up with and I've got all my frequencies that we came up with. So when you're asked to do a histogram, and in fact, when you're asked to do the other thing, which is called a frequency polygon, and we'll get to that in a minute, the first thing you're going to do is you're gonna draw a, a, an L. This is gonna be your Y axis and your X axis. So I'm gonna draw a nice big L right there. Anytime you do a histogram or anytime you do a frequency polygon, the Y axis, the Y axis is gonna represent your frequency. Your X axis is gonna represent whatever it is that the data represented. And in this case, it was income. So notice my frequencies here from the histogram are two, three, five, three, one, one. So I'm just gonna devise an appropriate scale on the Y axis. I'm just gonna count by ones. 
Okay, so I'm just gonna go one, two, three, four, and then five. Okay, just equal marks. Remember we talked very briefly about uh, what makes a graph good? What makes a graph good is you start your y-axis at zero, you have equal spaces. So if, if you have uh, something with large frequencies and you wanna count by twos or fives or tens, just make sure you do that the whole way. Don't start off counting by ones and then switch to fives when you're running out of room. Okay, you do all of one thing. I have in my frequency distribution, I have one, two, three, four, five, six classes. So what I'm going to do is down here on my, on my x-axis, I'm gonna make six marks. One, two, three, four, five, six equally spaced marks. Now I have to label these marks. Now there's different ways, it depends on your statistics book, but I think our book uses the most popular way to label our, our bars of the bar graph, we're not going to label the edges. What we're going to do is we're going to label the middle, okay? And what we're going to do, this is called the class mark. It's also sometimes called the class midpoint. Doesn't matter what terminology you use, the class mark or the class midpoint. And what you do to get your class mark or your class midpoint is you add up the lower bound plus the upper bound and divide by two. You're just getting the average of the lower and the upper. So for my first, my first uh, class, it was 31.5 was the lower. The upper was 37.6. And then I'm going to divide by two. So I'm going to go to my calculator. I've got 31.5 plus 37.6. I'm going to divide that by two and I get 34.55. So I'm going to label this first mark 34.55. You're allowed to go one extra decimal place than your, than your data. That's kind of a common practice. So you don't round that to 34.6. You don't truncate it to 34.5. Uh, 34.55 is perfect. Now I'm looking back over at my work because this all goes together. What's, uh, I know I'm pointing at it, but I just want to make sure that you're seeing it. What's the class width that we calculated from that first frequency distribution? 6.2. So what I'm going to do now is for my consecutive class midpoints or my consecutive class marks, I'm just going to add that 6.2. I don't need to go and keep calculating. You can if you want, but that's a lot more work. So when I add 6.2, I get 40.75. I'm trying to write nice and neat, which is against every impulse I have. I'm going to add 6.2 again, and I'm going to get 46.95. I'm going to add 6.2 another time, and I get 53.15. Two more times, 6.2, I'm going to get 59.35. And then finally, 6.2, one more time, I get 65.55. Okay, there are my class marks. That's the midpoint of each of the classes, and so it's going to be the midpoint of each of the bars that I draw. When you draw your bars, and I, um, I don't get a ruler out when I grade your tests. Just do your best job to try to draw a bar. To try to, wow, can't speak. To try to draw the bars equal width. Okay, so that you don't have. Uh, I mean, if you're as long as you're close, we are all good. And you'll see that I'm going to try to be close. So my first frequency is two. So I'm going to draw a bar that straddles that midpoint that goes up to two and over and down. And there we go. There's my first bar. Notice my mark is in the midpoint of the bar. It's not on the edge. We are labeling the class midpoint or the class mark. My next frequency was three. So my next bar is gonna go up to three. So it goes up one more. So we'll extend that and then come over and then down. Okay. So my bars are fairly close. I'm doing an all right job. This is pretty good for me. The next one goes up to five. So whoop, all the way up to the top and then down. The next one's at three again. 
And then the last two are at one. If you have one that has a zero, then you just don't draw a bar. You just go over to the next one. But my last two both have one. So one here and then one here. And so now we get a picture that helps us see what the distribution of the data looks like. So here's what I would like you to do before we talk about what a frequency polygon is. I would like you to do the same thing for example six, except this time we are using the uh, frequency distribution we made in example two. So for those of you who walked in after, here's that distribution. Uh, I'm trying to get everything on the screen and I think I've got it. So you can just use that distribution and make your, make your histogram and get the rest later. All right, so I'm just going to get started. If you have any questions, please let me know. I don't want this to be confusing. I want this last test to be a walk in the park for you. So I've made my L. The Y axis is always the frequency. My X axis in this case is population. That's what we were measuring in this one. My, my classes go up to a high frequency of eight. So I just counted by ones again up to eight. 
And then my first class mark, since I have seven classes, my first class mark, I calculated right here, 12.0 plus 15.9, that's the lower, the lower limit plus the upper limit divided by two. And that turns out to be 13.95. And you can see I put a 13.95 right there. My class width, now you can go and keep doing that calculation. You could get the class mark for the second one by doing 16.0 plus 19.9 divided by two. I just think that's a lot of work. So alternatively, I'm just gonna take the class width of 4.0 and I'm gonna add that repeatedly. So here we go. I'm gonna add 4.0. So when I do that, I've got 17.95. When I do it again, 21.95. One more time, 25.95, should have left myself a little more room, 29.95, 33.95, and then 37.95. And there's my class marks. Last thing I'm gonna do is draw my bars. My bars are gonna straddle each of those marks because those marks should be in the midpoint of each of the classes. So the first one has a frequency of eight, so I uh, got a little bit, uh, it's not quite a rectangle. It looks like a, a smokestack instead, but sorry about that. The next one has a frequency of four. So whoop, then down, that's a little bit better. And then six. And then one. The next two are zero, so you don't do anything. And then finally, the last one is one. So out here, pop up, we got one right there. And that is my, uh, that is my histogram. Histogram is a bar graph that represents the data in a frequency distribution. The other picture from a frequency distribution we're gonna talk about is called a frequency polygon. Uh, does everyone have what they need from this? Any information that you didn't quite get? Any questions that you have before I move on? All right, get it. Yeah. So that is a function of, so the question in case you didn't hear on the video is how do you know to stop at 37.95 and not keep going? So where that came from is when we created the frequency distribution, okay, the, the largest piece of data was 38. So I created enough classes here to accommodate the piece of data of 38. Once you have, once you have accommodated all of your data, you don't keep going. You don't need extraneous classes. Now I do need these ones here. It's significant that there's nothing here, but you don't add on ones afterward. Does that make sense? So what happened is we ended up with seven classes. So that's why I made seven marks over here. Okay, great question. Love it. Any other questions? Okay. So the other thing that we have, the other graph that we're, or picture we're gonna talk about is called a frequency polygon. So I'm gonna underline that. Here's what you do with a frequency polygon. The nice thing is there's not a whole lot of new information. Once you know how to do a histogram, uh, you know how to do a frequency polygon pretty much and vice versa. I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna draw my big L. On a frequency polygon, again, the y-axis is my frequency. My x-axis is whatever we're measuring, which in this case was income. I'm gonna do my, I'm gonna count by ones up here because we only had a frequency of five because we didn't have a large data set. We had six classes, so I'm going to make six marks again. One, two, three, four, five, six. Notice everything is exactly the same. So it's all the same startup. I'm going to label these as the class mark, just like I did before. So we've already done all that calculating. So 34.55, 40.75, 46.75, 47.75. I'm just copying down what I have right next door. 53.15, 59.35, and then the last one is 65.35. Now here's where we become different. So I'm gonna give you a minute to catch up doing all of, the, uh, all of the structure work on the outside. 
Uh, yeah, you should. You should. Now, instead of drawing a bar above each class mark, here's what you do. You draw a dot. Or I guess you just, do you draw a dot? You make a dot. Whatever you do to make a dot. So 34.55, we saw that that occurred with a frequency of two. So I'm just going to make a dot right above that. 40.75, that occurred with frequency three. So I'm going to make a dot. 46.95 occurred with a frequency of five. So I'm going to make a dot. 53.15 occurred with a frequency of three. And then the last two classes occurred with frequency one. If you have a class that occurs with frequency zero, you make your dot right there on the x-axis. And then you do two things. The intuitive thing is I'm going to connect the dots. So it's like we're in kindergarten again. So dot dot it's not going to make any sort of cool face or picture or anything okay so there we go and then after you've and after you've connected the dot all you do at the very end is this the leftmost dot wherever that is you just kind of connect down to the origin and the rightmost dot, you just kind of connect to an equidistant space on the x-axis. You don't make a dot or anything. You just, you just draw it down in. And that makes it a polygon. Remember, we defined a polygon a couple units ago as a closed figure. So that is now a closed figure. You could calc the reason you do that is now you could calculate the area of it. Uh, and there's in statistics significance uh, when you calculate the area in different portions, it also leads to probability, things like that. We're not talking about that here. I'm just letting you know why we close off the ends of the frequency polygon. So what I would like you to do, please, is in example six, I'd like you to construct a frequency polygon for that right there. All right, as I said before, all the outside structure, we've already gone through how all that is, is determined. It's determined in the same way, whether you're asked for a frequency polygon or a histogram. Remember, the histogram is the bar graph. The frequency polygon is the line graph that we connect the edges. So now I'm going to make my dots. The first class occurred with a frequency of eight. The next class occurred a frequency of four. The next one was a frequency of six. Then the next one was a frequency of... Is that one or two? I don't remember. One. Next one occurs with a frequency of one. And then the next two are a frequency of zero. So I make my dots right down there on the axis. And then the last one was a frequency of one. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to connect the dots. Whoop. 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 There we go. Dots are connected. The leftmost dot, wherever it is, you just connect with a straight line down to the origin. The rightmost dot, you just connect with a line that goes kind of equidistant. Don't make a dot on the axis because it's, there's no class there. Uh, we're just closing off the polygon. Seem reasonable? It seems reasonable to me. So there we go.
All right, so that's our frequency distribution. That's the graphs associated with the frequency distribution. We just got a couple more little things to go. We got just enough time. We're doing great. The next thing, example seven is, okay, let's say I don't want to construct a frequency distribution, but I still want to kind of get a picture to the distribution of my data. So here, what we got in this table is the ages of a sample of 20 guests who stayed at a bed and breakfast. What we're gonna construct is what's called a stem and leaf display. A stem and leaf display. Okay, in a stem and leaf display, what you do is this, whatever the last digit in your data is, those become the leaves. Okay, so the last digit. So I've just got two digits here. I've got a tens place and a ones place. The ones place are gonna be my leaves and whatever's in the tens place is my stem. So let me just... Okay, I'm just gonna draw a little, uh, a little T bar just like that. And I noticed that my data goes from a low value of, it looks like 29, correct me if I'm wrong, up 28, you did correct me, thank you for doing that, up to a high value of 72. So what that means is my stems are gonna look like this. I'm gonna put a stem for two for all of my data in the 20s, a stem of three for all my data in the 30s, and four for the 40s, five for the 50s, six for the 60s, seven for the 70s. And so now what we're going to do is we're gonna list one leaf for each piece of data. So if there's repetition, that's fine, you repeat it, okay? And in fact, we were both wrong about the lowest piece of data because now I'm seeing a 27. Okay, so here we go. You go in number order. So I've got for my 20s, it looks like I've got a 27, a 28, and a 29. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a leaf of seven. You don't use commas. You just kind of space them out e evenly. I'm going to have an eight and a nine. So I'm going to cross these out to help me uh, when I go and do this. Where was the 28? Oh, I already crossed out. There's 27. So what you do is in the, the value of a stem and leaf display when it's appropriate to use it is you retain your data, you can still see what the values are, but you can see that as you have more leaves you can kind of get a feel for what the frequency is. So for my 30s, I've got a 31, a 39, a 32, and that it looks to be it. So I've got 31, 32, 39. For my 40s, I've got a 43, a 47, and two, 40, or two 44s and a 45. So I've got a 43. I've got two 44s, so I'll put the number four twice. You do repeat. I've got a 45, and then I've got a 47. Trying to be careful not to miss anything because I'm working in pen and can't erase. For the 50s, I've got 56, 58, 59, I've got 50. So I'm gonna start off with a zero for the 50. And then I've got 56, 58, and 59. So six, eight, nine. 60s, I've got a zero. Let's put that down, there's nothing lower than 60. Then I've got a 62 and a 68. I think that's all. And then last but not least in the 70s, I've got a 71 and a 72. And we're done. That's, a, that's called a stem and leaf display. So you kind of still get the feeling for frequency. You can see which one occurs more than others and what occurs less. All right, flip the page. I'm gonna give you just a minute or two. Example eight is the same thing. Construct your own stem and leaf display. 18 students in a geology class were asked how many college credits they had earned. Construct a stem and leaf display for this data.
All right, so my lowest piece of data is 10. My highest, it looks like, is 62. So my stems are going to go from 1 to 6. Just as a bit of trivia, in case this happens on your homework, let's say you're doing this problem and somebody in the class only had earned four credits. They weren't in double digits. What do you think the stem would be for somebody with four credits? Yeah, zero. Excellent. No tens. So zero. I'm sorry? Yeah, so again, like our, uh, like our uh, frequency distribution, you would include any skips, but you don't include anything after. So I don't have any sevens or eights or nines here. But if we do not have any in the fours, we would leave it and we would just have nothing there. Okay. All right, here we go. So go with my teens, I've got 10 and 15 and 17. So there's three values right there. My 20s, I've got 24, and it looks like that's the only one. The 30s, I've got 36 and 30 and 33. Uh, so 30 and 33 and 36. There's two 24s. Oh, yes, there is. Thank you for having better eyes than me. I appreciate that. 40s, I've got 42, 48, 45 another 45, another 48. So I've got two, I've got a pair of 45s and a pair of 48s. 50s, I've got 53 and 54. And then 60s, I've got three, or excuse me, two 60s and a 62. Lots of credits. And there we go. There's no question about the stem and leaps. Uh, we're going to roar to the finish line. The last couple of questions that I have are just now, okay, if you're given something, let's, let's read it. So example nine, I've given, you, uh, I've given you this histogram, and now we are going to answer the questions. We're not going to answer question B, just for time's sake. That takes a little more time. And in all honesty, if you're going to take statistics, question B is not that important because you would figure it out uh, before making your histogram. Okay, so question A. What our histogram represents is the annual amount that people are earning in uh, dollars, or no, this is car insurance. The annual amount their car insurance is, and then the number of students who are represented in each category. So how will we calculate how many students were surveyed for this? What are we gonna do? Yeah, we're gonna add up all the bars. So this bar is at two, this one's at four, so that's a total of six. This is six more, so that's a total of 12. Eight makes 20, seven makes 27, three makes 30, and then one makes 31. So there were 31 students. I just added up the tops of all the bars. The C question says, how many students have an annual car insurance premium in the class with mark 752? So how many students were in the 752 class? Six, that's right. Right here, this is, this is the 752, so right where I made that purple line. The D part says, what is the class with the modal, uh, what is the class mark of the modal class? In case you're not familiar, which you probably aren't with the word modal. Modal means most. We're gonna talk more about that when we come back on Thursday. So which class mark has the most in it? Yep, 803, so that's dollars. So I'm gonna put 803 right there. So if you would do me a favor, we've got two more questions on the last page. Would you please do the same thing for example 10? Only difference is this time I gave you a frequency polygon instead of a histogram.
Okay, so the A question says, how many families visited the zoo four times? And what's the answer there? Here's four right here. And so when I look up from four, it is at eight. So eight families visited four times. How many families visited the zoo at least six times? Well, six, at least six means six or more. So at six, I've got 11. At seven, I've got nine if I'm reading right. So that's 20 total. At eight, I've got three. So that's 23. And at 10, I've got one. So that's 24. And then just like for the histogram, how many families were surveyed? You just add up all the dots. So we've already got the 24 for the at least six. And then at five, we have six more, so that's 30. Four and three each have eight, so that's 46. Two has two, so that's 48. And then at one, we have four, so that is 52 total people were surveyed when they visited the zoo. All right, last thing. We should have just enough time. We've got five minutes. We'll probably, I, I wasn't intending to do this whole problem. I was just going to do the first two parts anyway. So th this last problem isn't really a problem with the graph. It's just a reminder of how percents work. So reading the problem, it says 800 people who attended the circus were asked to indicate their favorite performance. Use the circle graph to determine the number of people in each category. So first, I just want you to know, I'm gonna circle it, that total there are 800 people. And whoever made this circle graph, instead of using the number of people for each pie, they used the percent. So we wanna figure out how many people liked tigers. So the, the circle graph said 38% of the people I talked to liked tigers. So how do I now figure out, somebody tell me, what do I do to figure out the number? Exactly, you take the total 800 and you multiply it by the decimal associated with the percent, which is going to be 0.38. And when I do that, 800 times 0.38 is equal to 304. So do me this favor, pick your favorite one, elephants, acrobats, jugglers, or other, and figure it out. I'm gonna do all of them so you can figure out what your answer is. And then we will be done with this lesson. All right, so if you picked elephants, you said 800 times 0.26 got you 208. If you picked the acrobats, 800 times 0.17 is 136. Jugglers, 800 times 0.14 is 112. And then other, 800 times 0.05 is 40.